This is Landierdog. It is a small seaside town that lies 25 miles north of Newport, on the coastline of the Bristol Channel. It has fallen on hard times lately. The line runs from Blindberris, where trains arrive from the main line, and then heads eastwards over the Penoyf Beacons, through Abersyth, and Pantigasog, before finally arriving at the seaside town of Landierdog. Goods from all over the country were brought here to be exported all around the world, while imported goods would arrive on ships to be taken away to the cities far away. This whole operation was dependent on the railway. But this wasn't to last. In the fall of 1962, the line fell victim to Dr. Beeching's modernization plan. Passenger services were cut on the line, leaving its stations to lie closed and forgotten. With the decline of exporting coal abroad, the port of Landierdog was closed. There was some reprieve. The line stayed open, so as to take coal traffic from Peniog Colliery to power stations around the country. Peniog Colliery, which is located half a mile west of Peniog, used to be the region's largest exporter of good quality anthracite, used in ships, on the railways, and in power stations. But even this traffic wasn't enough to save the line, and in late 1964, as the miners' strikes crippled coal production, the colliery and the railway the traffic ran on was forced to close down, leaving several thousand colliers, shipyard workers and railwaymen unemployed. The winter of 1964 was a dark time for the people of the Penoy Valley. Many men and women who once worked here were struggling to find alternative employment. There wasn't any to be found, and morale plummeted to an all-time low. As the desperate townspeople struggled to make ends meet, the roads were closed due to ice and snow, and with no railway line to use as an alternative, the townspeople, agitated with this shocking state of affairs, had had enough, and all rallied together to prevent the line from being scrapped. Your attention please, your attention please. Order. Order. I would like to call this meeting to a vote. All those in favour of forming a new railway company to commence running passenger and local freight operations along the line, say aye. Aye! aye. aye man. Several local townspeople, all good friends and railway enthusiasts, had clubbed together to form a railway preservation society. Mr Stovold, a distinguished Air Force pilot, who had earned the Victoria Cross for bravery during the Second World War, would act as company chairman. Mr Dibden, who retired as shed master of Blindberris Engine Depot when the line closed. With his many years of experience as an engine man, he would act as the head of motive power. Mr Edmondson, a former mechanical engineer from Yorkshire, who had worked for the National Coal Board at Peniog Colliery, would handle maintenance and would act as the chief engineer. Mr Bruce, a former bus driver and keen railway enthusiast, would be in charge of administration and fundraising. Mr Julian, a greengrocer who owned a shop in the town, would be in charge of signalling and communications. He had already begun collecting donations towards the refurbishment of Landia Dog Station. And finally, Mr Anthony, a former welder from the shipyard, would handle the carriage and wagon department. Mr. Anthony already owned several ex-Great Western coaches, which he had hoped to use as holiday homes. Finally, he could find a use for them. Together, they formed the Penoy Valley Railway Society. A meeting was called to form a new railway company to operate and run the railway themselves. During the meeting, many people from all over the country turned up to have their say, but sadly, they struggled to find the starting capital to get the company moving. Help was soon at hand, as Mr Davies, a former engineering officer of the Merchant Marine, turned up to offer a solution to their dilemma. For you see, Mr Davies was a rich man, 
Born and raised in Landyadog, a young Mr. Davies ran away to sea when he was just 15 years old, starting a life in the Merchant Navy. He went on to become an engineering officer, rising to the rank of Chief Engineer, before finally retiring from a long career as a surveyor at the Landyadog shipyard, and a major shareholder of the company. This had left him with a huge amount of experience of running a large company, as well as a large amount of money, and he was keen to use his skills well on into his retirement years. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have witnessed the decline of Landyadog firsthand, and I agree that something must be done. Our town has great potential. I would like to ask a question. If I were to fund the initial starting capital, and then help to find the capital for further expansion of such a project, would that make me a shareholder? Yes, that, that is correct. This company will be run by the board of directors with voluntary labour provided by the Preservation Society. We I see. Well, I am willing to put forward the capital for such a venture. But please tell me, once my own costs are recuperated, what would be done with the remaining profits? Well, the company would continue to run and any profits earned would be paid back as dividends on top of your investment. Ah, now you see, I am a self-made man, sir. I do not need anything more to please me in my twilight years. I must admit that my enforced retirement was something of a shock to me. The shipyards of Landyadog have provided employment to the local population for generations, but now that is no more. I am not the type of man to put on my slippers and read the paper, no sir. Should I join you in this venture, I would like to personally take on the role as general manager. I have contacts from my days in the shipping industry who may be very interested in this project, and once my own costs are repaid, I would be quite happy to work at no cost to the company. Call it my little project, if you will. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard our proposal and I would like to draw this meeting to a close by proposing a vote of confidence. All those in favour of Mr Davies' proposal to become the initial shareholder say aye. Aye! All those against? Motion passed. I have the honour of welcoming Mr Davies to the railway board of the Penoyth Valley Railway Company. The motion was passed. Mr. Davies had become the general manager, and the local townspeople set to work repairing the line for its reopening. Mr. Davies had done a great job rallying the local townspeople to volunteer to prepare the line for the first open season. With over 50 working volunteers and many other supporters from around the country thanks to Mr. Bruce's hard work of fundraising and promoting the railway, Work began in repairing the line to the standard demanded by the Light Railway Act. However, there was a problem. Whilst some rolling stock was on the way, the railway did not have any locomotives, and despite Mr. Davies' investment, the railway didn't have the funds to buy any. Mr. Anthony's coaches were immediately brought to the line, but it soon became obvious that a lot of work would be needed to make them usable. Well, they aren't exactly as clean as I expected, Mr. Anthony. But they've been sat in a field for ten years. What did you expect? Well, Mr. Anthony, I feel we're going to have to do some work to get these coaches ready. They'll be spick and span ready for the first train, Mr. Davies. Yes, but I am going to need some new material for the seats, Mr. Davies. With what money, Mr. Anthony? With what money? We have none. What? Not at all? We've spent virtually all of Mr. Davies' starting capital on transporting these rotten coaches here. Rotten coaches? How dare you? Gentlemen, gentlemen, please! Carry on, Mr. Bruce. <sighs> Funds are seriously low right now. We need to start running trains as soon as we possibly can, Mr. Davies. We need to make money and fast. But we have no engines, Mr. Bruce. What good are coaches with nothing to pull them? We need an engine. And fast. Hmm. I know where I can find you an engine. You can find me an engine, Mr. Edmondson? Even better, I can find you too. Mr. Davies was surprised to learn from Mr. Edmondson 
that two old locomotives had been left behind at Pennyog Colliery when it closed. And so with no time to lose, the team headed straight to the colliery to investigate. Well, well, first we have no engines, and now we have two. What is your name? My name is Ian, sir. When I used to work down pits, Mr Davies, I was Ian's fireman. He have not been overhauled since. I can see that, Matthew. Well, let's hope we can clean him up a bit and light his fire. And your name is? Leslie, sir. But you're a BR design, are you not? What are you doing here? Swindon built, sir, but mechanical problems, lots of them. Callboard weren't interested in repairing me. Made a bodge job of it, too. Mechanical problems? But are you operational? My engine was last started in October, sir. It hasn't been started since. Well, let's start you up and see what happens. Mr. Bruce, if you would, please. Mr. Bruce checked the oil levels, drained the water filters, and then, with a lot of cursing and banging, he tried to start Leslie's engine for the first time. Okay, Mr. Bruce, start him up. Right you are, Chief. At least the engine's turning over. Come on, start up, you useless piece of junk. Hey! Well, it's not going to fire, Mr Davies. Keep going, Thomas. Try again. It'll start. I can feel it. Ah, excellent work, Mr. Bruce. Well done, Leslie. You'll be very useful to us. We need an engine for construction and maintenance trains. Listen up, you two. I am reopening this railway as a preserved line. I am going to need your help to get it up and running. Ian, I'm afraid we can't do anything for you until we get you overhauled. And for that, we need money. Leslie, you will help us rebuild the track ready for the running season. Well, I think we can get Ian down to land here, Doc. We'll have to grease him up first. I understand. Let's see what we can do. Ian was greased and oiled, and with a hard pull, Leslie dragged Ian from his spot and pushed him all the way back to land here, Doc, where the volunteers had cleaned some of the sidings of foliage. Ian's valve gear moaned and groaned loudly the whole way. Once in the yard, they cleaned him up and prepared to light his fire. Sadly, his components were very worn out. His bearings were so badly worn, you could see right through them. Well, you don't see that every day. I've seen old trampers in a better state than this. Gah! <sighs> Bloody coal board! Have they never heard of maintenance? We couldn't afford it, sir. We had to make the best of what we had. <sighs> well, that has spoiled my plans. Right, well, at least we can make a start with the track. Leslie here will be very useful. I won't let you down, Mr. Davies. I can pull the passenger train. I... No, 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 no. You are too small to pull passenger trains on your own. But I can do it. I'm no smaller than Ian here. No, Leslie. I need you for maintenance work. It's more important right now. And besides, you're both too small to pull passenger trains. What's your maximum speed, Leslie? 15 miles an hour, Mr. Davies. Right, well, there's your answer, Leslie. I'm very sorry, but you were just too slow to keep to a timetable. And there is no way Ian here could pull a passenger train. His tanks are just too small for our line. He cannot do it. Not until we get some new bearings or coupling rods for him. I know where you can get them from. Where? I've heard of a place. It's called Barry Island. They have a scrapyard there. The engines that lived here before talked endlessly of it. Hmm. Barry Island, you say? That's not far from here. I'll have a look tomorrow. 
Mr. Davies decided to take a drive down to the seaside with his wife one day. And when they were there, they paid a visit to the notorious Barry Scrapyard. With steam on the western region coming to an end, new engines were arriving in the scrapyard on an almost daily basis. Oh, come on, William. You can play with your trains anytime. Not now, my love. I need to find coupling rods for my engine. Now, let's see. Mr. Davies asked the workmen if they knew of any coupling rods for a J-94. Sadly, there were none left. They had all either been bought by other preservationists or scrapped. Mr. Davies sighed and strolled around the yard, amazed at the long lines of stored locomotives awaiting their fate. Hmm. What now, William? I've had an idea. Oh, not another one! I have told you! We are not having a conservatory, and that is final! No, woman, not that. About the railway. I need an engine to pull trains, but look, look here. There must be an engine suitable. But, well, you look at them! They're all old wrecks! Hey, you aren't exactly a spring chicken yourself. <laughs> oh, well, really? Now then, what I need is a mid-sized engine. Something powerful, but not too expensive to run. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. How can I help you? My name is William Davies, General Manager of the Penoyth Valley Railway Company. I need an engine to run my line. Well, you've come to the right place. If you find one suitable, I'll let you have it at scrap value. That's very kind of you. Right then, let's see what you've got. And so, Di Woodham took Mr. Davies around the yard, showing him potential engines for him to buy. How about this? Too big. How about one of these? Too rusty. This would be perfect. How much for this one, my good sir? Sorry, Gov. This one's sold already. Do you have any more like this? Uh, yes. We had one in yesterday. Great. Can I see it? But it has no tender. No. None of my engines do. What? I had British Steel down here a few months ago. They bought all the tenders I had. They use them for water carriers or to carry steel billets or something. Well, how can I have a tender engine without a tender? You'd have to have one made. Have one made? Gordon Bennett. Do you have any mid-sized engines with tenders here? None, Gov. I got none. We get new engines in every day, though, so perhaps you could come back again. <sighs> okay, well, I guess I'd better be going. You could always try cash moors in Newport. I hear they have some J94s. Whatever those are. No, I need something bigger than a J94. Have you got any hauls? What about me, sir? Oh, pay him no attention, squire. Now over here we got- No, 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 hold on, hold on. You? So, why would you be the solution to my problem? Because, sir, I have a tender. I was given a light overhaul before I was scrapped. My boiler is good for at least another five years. Five years, you say? Well, that puts a few ticks in boxes. Where were you based before being scrapped? Bath Green Park, on the Somerset and Dorset line, sir. Ah, the famous S&D. So you have no problem climbing hills, then? None at all, sir. What's your name? I... I, I don't have a name, sir. How much for him, Di? Car, you don't hang around much, do you? Well, you got a lot of work to do on him. Tell you what, since he's been here so long, you can have him cheap. You're a good man, Di. No, I'm not. Well, you know, I suppose I am. All right, don't revel in it, man. Now then, what to call you? I've never had a name before. How about Di? After this nice man that saved you. Splendid idea. Do you like the name? Yes, sir. Very much so. Very good. Well, Di, we haven't got much time to get you repaired. 
I need you in working order ready to start the running season. We're counting on you. I won't let you down, sir. Mr. Davies went with Di Woodham to his office. Mr. Woodham was as good as his word, and the two gentlemen made a deal and bought Di at a very good price. Next day, Di was collected from the scrapyard by a diesel which Mr. Davies had arranged. He was oiled up and prepared for his journey to Landyadog. The heavens opened and it began to rain. Di began to feel nervous. Well, I haven't moved in several years. I hope I can still roll. Di, you'll be as fit as a fiddle before you know it. Don't you worry, boss man. I'll soon have him moving. The diesel pulled hard and Di's wheels cracked and groaned as the rusted valve gear creaked into motion once again. He winced in pain as his valve gear turned for the first time in years. Ugh! Oh, I'm seized! I'm seized up! Keep going! The diesel kept going, and soon, Di's motion was clear. The workmen applied more grease and oil to prepare Di for his long journey. Di said his goodbyes to the other engines of the scrapyard. They were all very happy for him to be going off for preservation at last.